from the same institution and I've been in LARPA for 16 years now. Uh, I'm making my master's, my second master's actually, in uh, anthropology and this is a part of it. Uh, I've been trying to compare practices of rule usage in Russian and Nordic LARPs. Uh, there are no developers here, so I'm really very afraid, and I expect <laughs> to hear some comments uh, by them. And I'm awfully sorry if I've been mistaken somewhere. Uh, it seems Try the, the right arrow. Maybe point at the projector. Is it connected to the other computers now? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Is there a problem? Oh, just tell me when it's Okay, thank you. Yeah, from the back. So, please, next to see if you Yeah, you're back, so not everyone. Yeah. Is that better? Uh, you're still late. So, I'll, at first I'll talk about uh, Russian and Nordic labs and how, uh, what are they? Uh, as I've already told you, the field of my studies is cultural anthropology and I'll uh, say a few words about how uh, LARPs are studied within this field of uh, scholarships and uh, what I've been doing during this research. Uh, I've been LARPing, of course, during Knudepunkt. I've attended three Knudepunkts and I've been to LARP Writer Summer School that is also organized by Nordic LARPers. And, uh, of course, I've been playing Russian LARPs for many years. Uh, then I've been asking many people during the previous, this year, Knudepunkt about what a Nordic LARP actually is. And I've been trying to compare it of, with what they are t saying in their articles, because sometimes uh, things change. Uh, and uh, I've tried to compare um, the sets of rules, the rule books of Russian and Nordic LARPs, of the rules uh, according to which this world is conducted and how it appears, this group imagination. Uh, and in this world, of course, has its own uh, laws and rules, and then these rules and laws can be written or they can be not written. Uh, these are laws of the country, for example, and some of them are just uh, the code of conduct that can, be, can exist just in our uh, starting with Wittgenstein, uh, and of course there is some particular order in how the society lives and social life. Nordic clubs tend to be more narrativistic, so the quality of the story you have been involved in is more important than I, whether you win or not, or whether you were really deep inside uh, your character or not. Because what I observe in the Nordic clubs is that the the line, the border between the player and the character is really important. You're, you, as a player, often know much to play in an audio. While in Russia, it is highly appreciate, appreciated that you are inside your character and uh, the deep immersion is really, really very important. Uh, okay, I, I don't have much time to speak about the history of Nordic clubs. Uh, so, but there are a lot of people from Nordic countries. So, uh, now I'll tell you about uh, the comparison. We had something like a few during the Moscow Lock Convention in Kampun that took place in March. And uh, we compared several uh, sets of rules in of Russian uh, LARPs and Nordic LARPs. And if in Russian LARPs, life and death of the character depend uh, on the laws of the game world, uh, in Nordic LARP the game world is more or less flexible. In Russian uh, LARP it is possible to die, uh, sort of go into the toilet because you are killed, or you can be assassinated in the dark street, and it's uh, absolutely normal and it may happen like two hours after the game starts. And in Nordic LARP, uh, people decide themselves what was the effect. Should I die now, or may I die later, or maybe I just don't need to die? And it seems that while in Scandinavia uh, the game focus is in character character interaction, and the reality of the game world is being constructed thanks to interpersonal relations and demand to 360 degree resolution, in Russian art, modern rules are one of the main factors, and I've already said about it. 
and so they influence and create the game world. Uh, in Russian arts, we don't have rule recommendations, but we have a rule that conduct you and that are uh, something inevitable in the game world. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they create a homogeneous and very clear and logical world for those who are inside it. Uh, and at the same time, this world looks very strange and conventional for the outsiders. Uh, as, like, you may see a blue uh, piece of cloth, and this is the river, and then you see the brown piece of cloth, and this symbolizes the mountains. While uh, in the Nordic Club, if you need a ship, you just drive the ship. And if you need a Viking village, they can play to Viking villages, and they can go to Poland to play the castle. Um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I have one minute, and I will tell you about the tiny layers, which seem to be very interesting for me, because uh, in Nordic Club, uh, what you see is what you get. Principle leads to the time goes straight, and one hour may symbolizes one hour, and if you have some time gaps, it is mentioned by the game masters, like two months passed, and we are playing the next scene. While in Russia, we have two time layers. We are playing our everyday life, like drinking coffee with our neighbors and having small talks, and at the same time, we are living in the layer of global events, like the revolution may pass, or the city may be besieged, and your brother may come from the war and be a hero, while you were drinking tea. So this is what also distinguishes us um, according to the time perspective. The, in my article, which may be will be published in the book, Proceedings, uh, there, is, there are some more uh, words about this time layer, so uh, I will be really glad to, to, to discuss it with someone if you are interested. I think that's all what I had. And I have nine seconds. Uh, so this is the bibliography, and this is uh, the bibliography. And you are very welcome to ask me questions. Thank you for your attention.